Hi, I'm Stern Boyson, and he's a critical care specialist. I'm Serge Shalhoub. Uh, Serge is a small animal internal medicine specialist, and we're here today to present our first UCVM VCDS video podcast, Bringing Veterinary Education, Open Access, Around the World. That's right. We work for the University of Calgary Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, and today we'd like to start our podcasts with Veterinary point of care ultrasound in small animals. And this is a topic very near and dear to my heart, uh, point of care ultrasound. So, just to introduce everybody and catch everybody up to speed on what we're talking about, we're going to try and uh, introduce a quick case here, and then we're going to go through some of the more common things that uh, we refer to when we talk about point of care ultrasound. Sounds good. Let's talk about this case, sir. All right, so this is Mittens. Mittens is a six and a half year old domestic short hair. That has been missing for two days and the owners found mittens outside and brought mittens immediately into the emergency clinic. And on our initial triage examination, we look at mittens and the mucous membranes are pale, capillary refill time is prolonged, the heart rate's 142, respiratory rate's 44 breaths per minute with increased harsh lung sounds, no obvious murmur, no obvious gallop rhythm when we're listening to the chest, but the lung sounds are harsh and the temperature is 37.4 degrees Celsius. What do you think? You're an internist, uh, but I think you can probably figure this one out. Sir, you tell me, is this patient stable or unstable and why? Well, sir, I would say unstable. Okay, and what, what was your assessment there to tell you that this patient's unstable? I don't know, I didn't like that heart rate a lot and uh, a cap refill time, uh, even for an internist, that sounds pretty prolonged. Good. And then we've got the pale mucous membranes and we've got a weak femoral pulse. So we definitely have signs of cardiovascular and respiratory unstable patient in this situation. We're obviously going to start our resuscitation and how sure. are you going to figure out what's going on? We've got to act pretty quickly. What, what, are, we, what are your choices? What are you going to be doing here? Uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing I'd want to see here is abdominal and thoracic radiographs. I want to see a lot of x-rays, like 10, 20 different x-rays. You could go do some x-rays, it will give you some information in terms of what's going on in the chest and the abdomen, but there's a good chance that you're going to kill this cat on the radiology table. What? If our patient's unstable, it is a concern, one, to take him out of the emergency room, and two, to restrain him, increases work of breathing, increases stress. What do you recommend, sir? So this is where we've started to talk about point of care ultrasound. How long does this take? Less than five minutes, I'll get my scans done. This is done at the cage side. This patient's sitting on the table, I've got a tech putting an IV catheter in, I've got somebody getting a blood pressure, the ECG's been hooked up, maybe we're giving them fluids, maybe we're not. We're giving them some oxygen, we're giving them analgesia. While all this is happening, I'm picking up my ultrasound probe, and I'm putting this on that patient, and within five minutes, I can probably tell you what's going on in that patient. That sounds pretty fantastic. And the nice thing about this, if you look at the literature out there, this does not take a lot of extra training. So we're not looking at high level uh, training in terms of uh, specialists in radiology. This is something that general practitioners, emergency doctors can easily learn and apply in their patients. It doesn't take that much training, right? Like even a child could pretty much do this. is what you're, you're kind of telling me here. Uh, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Tell me more about this. Well. The main goal, if we put these uh, ultrasound probe on in that five minutes, there's a few things that we're looking for. We're okay. looking for an underlying cause. So we're looking for that pathology that tells us why, in this case, mittens is unstable. Okay. It will hopefully help us then if we find something, let's say we find some free fluid somewhere, one of our main goals in many of these cases, it can then allow us to direct further diagnostics towards obtaining that fluid and figure what direction we're going in in that patient. All right. What about helping, like potential next steps? Would it help you with that? Yes, exactly. And that's the other thing. If we put the ultrasound probe on and we find lesions in the lung or we find them in the abdomen, it's going to help us direct therapy in terms of oxygen, maybe further analgesics. If we get a sample in the patient's septic, we know that right away. So as a diagnostic tool, it helps us collect a sample that tells us the underlying problem and therefore we know we need to drain that or put them on antibiotics or whatever it is that we need to do. Um, so I'm getting it now. What you're saying is this doesn't replace the physical exam, radiographs or anything else. It complements, has its place, certainly in the early minutes when you're, you're doing everything else with that patient. I would actually say that's a good summary, Dr. Alright, All right, fair enough. Is there, is there a fancy name to this or previous names to this? Does it have a specific acronym or name? We're talking mostly about focused assessment of sonography for trauma or more commonly now triage because it encompasses more, but we're essentially talking about fast exams. Fast. I like that. Certainly fits with the type of exam you're doing. It's pretty fast, under five minutes. Yes, and I will say that, that uh, yeah. Okay. Can you tell me about the different types of techniques here? Or is it just, like, w w where are you using it? Classically, focused assessment of sonography for triage exams of the abdomen, AFAST, of the thorax, commonly referred to as TFAST. We're also starting to see in the veterinary literature a lot of lung ultrasound. Okay. And we'll talk about that as well. All right. um, and there is an ongoing movement now moving towards things including even the heart, um, 
the vascular system for volume status, and we're looking at some other things too, including the gallbladder as well. So those are things that we will cover in future podcasts. Sorry, I don't know. Your my head's getting a little dizzy. That sounds like a lot of ultrasound. Are you sure this can be done in five minutes? And this has been validated. So again, a lot of the earlier studies, the A fast and the T fast, has been demonstrated and validated in the veterinary literature and shown that the average time for non-specialists to complete these examinations is under five minutes. If you're adding them together. It does take a little bit more time, but I would say that this is still something that can be easily completed in under 10 minutes, and with a bit wow. of experience, all That's of these amazing. views can be done in under five. I agree. This is amazing. Fantastic. So wait, let, let me get this right. Uh, fr from what I understand, from what I remember, when you, you were training me, your name was on this fast paper. You're, so you're the one who created this. That's pretty awesome. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Actually, what I did was I read some human literature, and I simply took that protocol and adapted it to veterinary medicine. So we published that out of Tufts, uh, Dr. Zansky, Dr. Rush, my mentors, as well as a lot of my resident mates, and that was a very team effort, collaborative approach to setting up that first translational study, we'll call it, from human to veterinary medicine. So you're telling me to do veterinary research, you don't need to be a genius? I'm saying there's a lot of veterinary geniuses out there, Dr. Salute, that do some amazing research, but in my case, I'm going to say you can simply read the human literature and adapt a lot of what they do to the veterinary profession. And is it pretty much the same, the human fast versus the veterinary fast, or did you do something different here? There's a lot of similarities between the human yeah. abdominal fast studies and the abdominal fast studies that we're now doing in veterinary literature. One of the big things we did, though, we turned the animal on its side. Ooh, okay, I get it now. That is pretty genius. I like that. All right. So talk to me about these sites. Where are you putting the probe here? So we're putting the probe at four different locations. Subziphoid, diaphragmatic hepatic site, by putting the probe at the subziphoid. Uh, so essentially right here, or if our patient, we're gonna be putting our probe right here at that subziphoid location and looking at the liver, uh, between the liver lobes, between the liver and the diaphragm, and we'll talk about in later podcasts, extending further into the thorax. So we got Lily here that's gonna act as our uh, Lily. model. Lily. All right. yeah, Lily, my daughter's dog, acting as our, our model. Hi, Lily. Uh, we want to look at the left um, paralumbar region, so we're going to be down in this region here, sort of right behind the ribs looking for that uh, left kidney, and this is the also known as the spinal renal site. We're going to look at on the other side of the patient, on that right paralumbar region, we're sort of going after that hepatic and renal site, so the hepatic renal site or right sublumbar region, okay. and then we're going to come in sort of midline over the bladder, and we're going to assess that area over the bladder in our last view, and that's also known as the sister colic So I think I understand that, but I've also read about this uh, a fifth view, which I'm not too clear on that. We have a video here showing essentially that exact. Yeah, let's uh, take a look at this video here. You think about where free fluid accumulates on your fast examination, it's in the gravity dependent spot. So our fluid's actually gonna be accumulating down here. Two things to avoid when you're doing your ultrasound on your fast exam. Some people will actually come in at low angle here and they'll push the probe up like this. What that does is it creates a V of skin on either side of the probe. And if you push the probe up like this, what you're actually liable to do is move the fluid from that gravity dependent spot to either gutter on the side of the probe. So if you push in heavy like this, the fluid tends to accumulate on the two gutters on either side of the probe. Therefore, what we're doing if we're just looking for free fluid at this spot, it's not a bad idea to take a quick flash at the umbilicus. If you think about where the fluid's going to accumulate, and you wanted to do an aspiration without ultrasound, you would aim it like this to try and catch this pocket down here where my fingertips are. So that's what we'll do with our probe then. We can put our probe on the umbilicus, and we can just aim it down towards that gravity-dependent spot, and we can search that area. Again, moving the probe cranially, and we can see the liver coming in here. Move it ventrally, so fan it around and move it without moving it a great deal from one spot, but we'll move back and forth, fan and rock the probe and look for the presence of free fluid in that gravity-dependent pouch at the umbilicus. Wow, you're convincing me, sir. But as an internist, as an internist, you know me, I, I can't fly by the seat of my pants, I need a little more structure. I, are these studies gonna be done in left lateral, right lateral? Tell me a little more here, I'm confused. The original okay. studies were in lateral recumbency. However, if our patients are unstable and they're resistant to restraint or we're really worried about them, particularly if they're dysmic, and they're breathing more comfortably in sternal or standing position, then absolutely we can scan these patients in standing, sternal, left lateral, right lateral. All right, I like that. Uh, the one thing I will say though is you do want to avoid putting patients on their back. I know you guys as internal medicine people, you like to put that's, your animals on their back when you scan them. And shave. And we'll talk about oh, that shortly, yeah. but we don't want to put this, them on their back. This is revolutionary, I mean. All right, I like that. So one thing though, I mean humans, I mean, 
they're not that hairy, right? So you, you could put a probe on there, it's not a big deal. But I mean, look at look at even this this thing here is you know what? Do you, how do you get the probe to have contact with seafood? You have to clip. Okay, so that is a misconception in terms of you have to clip. So if you don't get a good image quality, you certainly can shave the fur. All right. You know, I like using those clippers, so not using the clippers. But what about gel? You know how much I love using my gel. For us on the emergency scanning, we will place alcohol. So we'll just spray our animals with some alcohol. Okay. And part the fur so that we have good contact between the skin at the level that we want to examine and put the probe there and we will get a good image that tells us what we need to know. And all the clips that you're going to see in the future podcasts that we have here are done without shaving, just using alcohol. What, so what's this combination thing? So this is something that I think actually originated on the human side as well. But you've got gel-based alcohol hand sanitizers. And this actually worked quite well as a combination of gel and alcohol. Sanitize your patient at the same time. That's fantastic. So hold on. You, you were kind of poking fun at me earlier for putting my patients on their back. What, I, I don't understand what the problem is. That why, why is that such a big issue? You get such a nice position on their back. You can locate all the organs. Why not? If you put dogs or cats on their back when they're dysmic, this will increase your work of breathing. It will increase the degree of effort. What else, though? So cardiovascular instability is a little more difficult to understand, but if you think about this from a physiologic standpoint, when they're in a sternal standing position, that weight is on the ventral part of the abdomen. We put them in dorsal. All the weight of those organs now is compressing on the vena cava, for example, and that will decrease venous return to the heart. Okay. And there are certain situations in patients that are cardiovascular stable where that decrease in venous return, for example, pericardial fusion case, could result in the decrease right. in venous return to the point that they will arrest. Interesting. Okay. I can totally buy that. So we've talked a lot about this FAST, and that was your, your first study. What, do, what are you looking for with abdominal FAST scans? So it's come a long way, and I'm going to say that the basic key point to start yep. is looking for free fluid, and that's at those four sites that we mentioned. So I think I understand why you think even someone like me can do this, because all you're looking for is fluid. You're not looking at the spleen specifically or anything else. It's fluid. So when you're starting out, you're going to look for fluid. As you get more comfortable with ultrasound, you can certainly expand and include other components in your emergency evaluation of your patients. But now, again, as an internist, you know, I'm really liking this, but let me know if something. Probe can tell you what kind of fluid there is, right? Is that, is that the key here? So, I don't know what you're getting taught, but if you're thinking you can detect what the actual fluid is, you can see differences in echogenicity of the fluid, but you don't know what the fluid is. If you want to know what that fluid is, you want to be definitive on that, I would strongly recommend you collect a sample of the fluid and you'll look at that cytologically or evaluate it okay, uh, fine. chemically. Fine. Now, what about seeing fluid in one site versus three sites? Does that make a difference? What, what is that? Is that anything? So there is actually an abdominal fluid scoring system, again, that was developed uh, by Dr. Lisiandro, and this basically says how many sites are positive. So if I do those four scans yep. and I find this fluid at one site, doesn't yep. matter which site, any one of those four, that's positive one. So that's an AFS so score, abdominal fluid score, one of one. Six. One out of four, because you've got four, four sites. Four sites. Stick with me, four bear sites. with me here, sir. Right. So you've got four sites. You get positive any one, that's yeah. one out of four. Gotcha. One positive out of four. any two would be? Two out of four. Positive in any three? Three out of four. And positive in all four sites? Bad. Four out of four. Yep. The higher the score, the more likely you are to need a blood transfusion. So it's, the, it's that follow-up that's really more Yeah, and I'll bring this I into the you. serial exams. Yeah. You want to see if that fluid is getting worse over time or decreasing over time. Yep. We don't tend to use the abdominal fluid score to help us predict whether we need to go to surgery or not. Gotcha. Uh, even on the human side, they don't really have a clear-cut okay. score system that tells you surgery or not. So, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the abdomen. So let's move on to the thorax. I mean, you know, patients are hit by cars. I mean, there's a lot of thoracic trauma. Can you use this for the chest? Dr. Salou, you most certainly can evaluate the thorax with fast scanning as well. Tell me this about. leads to thoracic focus assessment of sonography for triage, trauma or triage again, known as TFAST. And essentially, the original studies on this, they looked at the chest tube sites, sort of the ninth intercostal space and okay. the caudal dorsal area on one side over the heart, so in that fourth to sixth intercostal space, more ventrally over the age of the heart, pericardial site. Okay. They do that on both sides, so that's four views. And they also include a sub view where you angle the probe, same site as that site we talked about when we did the abdomen yep. scanning, but oh, you tip the probe more cranially and increase the depth so that you can actually assess the pleural and pericardial. Exactly. Okay. So you're looking at the thorax through the sub site. And so. since then, what's come up? There's regional lung scans now, and there's a few of them out there. Yeah, there's a few of them out there. Okay. 
Uh, so I'll just touch base on those real quick. We realized, particularly at this chest tube site of the TCAST examination, that we were a bit in lung pathology. But we weren't covering enough of the lung to really assess yep. full lung. There are protocols now that are looking at regional lung ulcer. Interesting. So okay. there is an eight point scan called Vet Blue, and it looks at the chest tube site, perihilar, and then areas cranial and caudal essentially to the heart okay. on both sides. There's another study out there that was done in Italy. This is by Dr. Armanese, and he's looking at more extensive lung, and he's got a nine point uh, scan on either side, so 18 scan points in total where you're moving cranial three sites in the dorsal region, moving into the middle region over the perihilar and looking at three sites there, and then okay. going ventral and looking at three sites. Okay. And then there's a sliding protocol that's also developed where you move up and down between the ribs. So we, can you kind of summarize what the indications are? Trauma is a big indication. You get any patient that comes in with trauma, you should be putting a probe on that patient for sure. And what, what clinical findings are you talking about? What, what things are you looking for in your physical exam and your initial data to tell you this is definitely worthwhile. And those are patients that might have cardiovascular instability or dyspnea. They're likely to have lesions leading to accumulation of blood, for example. So we're going to do that in case they have low hematic grit, low total solids, gotcha. high lactates, high heart rates, we external pulses. injuries. Exactly. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. Are there limitations though? I mean, it sounds like pretty awesome, but are there anything, any limitations when it comes to trauma? So, as I said, trauma, I would put the probe on anything that has trauma. Put the probe on. Blunt trauma, more likely to result in fluid accumulations or lesions we're going to detect in the thorax, such as contusions to the lung. We'll talk about this in later podcasts. Okay. It comes to penetrating trauma, yep. low sensitivity. Okay. So we can miss injuries if we've got penetrating trauma. And what else? You will also find that it's not very sensitive on the human side or probably in the veterinary side we're extrapolating here, but retroperitoneal injury again. Retroperitoneal. That said, if you do the scan and it's positive, yep. you know it's positive. You can act on that. Gotcha. So it's still worth doing. So a negative fast rules out injury? Not an accurate statement. We were doing well together there for a bit there, dude, but you just, you just fell off the wagon. So as we talked about, positive result is real. Gotcha. You act on it. And negative result, again, it's a focused exam. We're not looking at the entire abdomen. The abdomen comes in, or a patient comes in with acute abdomen, yep. maybe it's got an ulcer. We're not going to pick that up on a fast exam unless it perforates and we get septic abdomen. That's the reassessment. Or other diagnostic tests that would further complement. So maybe a formal ultrasound of the full abdomen by a radiologist or somebody with that experience and training to find those lesions that we're not looking for. As an internist, tra trauma's all nice, and that's that's your thing, and that's that's great, you know, trauma, ooh, sounds very, you know, ER, critical care, but I'm an internist. What's what's the use of this for me? Because I don't see a lot of trauma. We actually uh, have a student uh, that graduated with us that did a study while they were a student uh, here at the UCBM, and that person is Dr. Jantina McMurray. She's now a vet. She was in our third class to graduate. She's been out there, and she's done a few studies on ultrasound. But Dr. McMurray is actually somebody that probably could speak more to this than, than I can because it was her study. So it would be nice if we had Dr. McMurray here. Look at that. Whoa, Dr. Hey, McMurray is whoa. here. So, Dr. McMurray, welcome to our first UCBM veterinary podcast. Thank you. It's very kind of you to invite me. I think I'd just roll on in here. So tell us a little bit about this focused assessment uh, of sonography for non-trauma. What's the rationale behind that and what did you do with the study? So basically, we, we just wanted to see what the potential value of point-of-care ultrasound would be in a non-trauma patient population. So we looked at 100 dogs and cats that came in through the emergency department for non-trauma-related reasons, and did a, an abdominal scan and a thoracic scan. We found that in patients that were stable on presentation, about 10% of them had free fluid in the abdomen, pleural space, or pericardium. So not a lot of patients that come in stable are going to have free fluid or lesions you can detect on the AFAST and TFAST? Not very many, but, but the number wasn't zero either. So there were certainly some cases where we did pick up findings on ultrasound that ended up uh, guiding our approach with those patients. Even, so it's still even worth doing? Well, still worth doing, especially I think if you have a, a high index of suspicion for uh, certain disorders um, or certain um, pathologies. Okay. What are the odds if it's unstable? This is where the study got really exciting. <laughs> In unstable patients, we actually found that more than 75% of them had free fluid in one or more of those body cavities. So this can be applied to both species? Right. So we found no significant difference uh, in the prevalence of free fluid between dogs and cats, including both stable and unstable. All right. And you did this as a fourth year veterinary student? Yeah, I was a fourth year vet student. I had about three hours of lecture time on these topics and then three hours of hands-on practice and some supervision for the first few cases. but. For the most part, uh, doing this study as a student really emphasized to me that you don't need a lot of experience with this. You don't need uh, to 
be someone who uses ultrasound a lot to gain a lot of value from point of care ultrasound. And if you had to summarize this, what's your take home message then when you're applying ultrasound to these patients that come in to the emergency service in general? My take home message would be that vets in general practice can and should be doing these procedures and that uh, patients that have serious pathology will have findings that you can detect with ultrasound. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us on our first official UCBM podcast with Dr. McMurray. Hopefully we'll see you again in the future. All right. I'm out, I guess. Ugh. Man, I uh, got a little dizzy there when you threw me aside there, but uh, I'm kind of getting the point of this. If you were to find fluid and you were to remove some of that fluid, I know in FAST, I, I take it it was mostly blood that you would be pulling out, right? In the original trauma studies, more often than not, your blood, but you might have a ruptured gallbladder, you could have a ruptured urinary bladder in there. You can't say sure. for sure. You need to get a sample yeah. of that fluid. But it does emphasize, I think, where you're going here. Yep. The non if you're non-trauma cases, cases yep. and you see free fluid, man, and you think about the number of cases that you've eventually diagnosed over the years that have yep. pathology that results in fluid accumulation. It could be a pyothorax in the chest, chylothorax. You could have a hemoabdomen, you could have a uroabdomen, you could have bile peritonitis. So anything. Except the, you name it. If it's fluid, could you just about anything. So you need to do a synthesis. Pretty you much all the do time. I got you. And what about if that patient comes in dehydrated? Is that, uh, does that make a difference? Should you reevaluate them later? You know, we always talk about that when, when we talk about fast scans. If you have pathology somewhere, for example, inflammation in the abdomen, as you resuscitate them, there's a good chance you're going to lose fluid into that site that's affected. Yep. And therefore, over time, your fast exams will become nice. positive. So roughly every two to four hours as needed is really what it comes down to, is that right? General rule of thumb, I'd say every two to four hours, but as needed depending on the response of your patient. Assess your patient. You can't overemphasize the value of physical exam and triage exam. If your patient isn't responding as you think it should, yep. then I would rescan it right away if I don't know why that patient's not responding. So you're seeing here we actually agree on something. Two to four hours is, is a good time frame. Two to four hours, general is a good time frame, but if 30 minutes after I start resuscitation, he's not doing what I want him to do, I'm rescanning him. So can we just re-emphasize what the key points of FAST are? All right, so we'll, we'll wrap up our, our podcast here with a summary. The key points in the FAST, we do this during resuscitation. This is done at the cage side while well, everything else is going on. And it takes five minutes, really at five minutes, which is awesome. Minimal experience? You don't need to be a specialist and it takes minimal training. And it's repeatable? That's the whole serial fast exam. There's no radiation associated with it, so it's safe. You don't have to radiate your patients. You can simply scan them. All right. No x-rays during uh, those uh, early early minutes there. I'm saying x-rays have their value. They have their value. But, but when they're unstable, they're sick, I get it. I there's better it. ways. Yeah. And you don't have to clip them. You don't even have to use gel if you don't need. You don't want to. There's, there's, there's no traumatic portion to this. Nope. Okay. All right. Well, I'm... Uh, Pretty sold on here, uh, Doctor B. I think uh, I think this is pretty good. And that concludes our first veterinary UCBM VCDS video podcast. Thank you so much for joining us and also tolerating us. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.